Hi, Al. So I'm going to be broadcasting these online lectures out of the studio of Ed Keenan. Um, he's agreed to quite graciously help me in producing these. Hi, uh, my name's Ed, and I'm really happy to have Mark here. Um, he's a friend of mine, and uh, I'm going to basically play the role of student and try and ask questions, but um, I would definitely want to say that you should definitely send your questions in via email, Slack, Discord, or whatever protocol you guys are using at this time, but definitely want to encourage everybody to stay safe and, uh, you know, glad to be a part of this as well. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to be returning to Hume. We're going to talk about this problem of induction, what implications that has for the possibility of our knowing things through scientific theories about, say, what the world will be like in the future, or a lot of our ordinary reasoning via induction. We'll talk a little bit about Hume's, Hume's view regarding personal identity and thinking about that as a response to Descartes. And we'll look at Hume's theory of free will. So recall, David Hume is born in the 18th century. He's born in 1711 dies in 1776. He has a fairly significant influence on the development of empiricism. He argues for a much more stringent kind of empiricism than we see in Aristotle. He thinks that we have to embrace the sort of radical skepticism that we see deployed in Descartes. He thinks that we ought to be sort of sensitive to the ways in which that could undermine the possibility of our having knowledge or that what beliefs we have may, be, may fail to be accurately representative of the, of the world is. He's inspired by these developments in the natural sciences, the development of the microscope, so the recognition that the objects in the world that we see as, say, like, rather flat, like a tabletop, is actually composed of a great many atomic particles and... At the atomic level, the flatness is sort of inexplicable. So he thinks we ought to be skeptical of our senses, but he thinks, nonetheless, that's really the only way that we come to know anything about the world. It's through a kind of measured empirical investigation. And so he wants to reject all of these ideas we've seen kind of proposed by Plato Aristotle to a some more questionable extent, and then again in Descartes, the idea that, well, there's these objects of knowledge that we can only come to by means of reason, that that couldn't be adequately accomplished by means of experience. So he thinks, for instance, our claims about mathematics, this is something that goes beyond the empirical world. Hume thinks we can actually provide empirical explanations of how we get these concepts. Recall, he thinks that this sort of crucially depends on this notion of a distinction between what he will call ideas and impressions, and he thinks these fundamentally occupy a kind of continuum. So we have impressions as the kind of most immediate experience. Say you have the impression of a table or a chair. That's an impression of a particular object. When you think about that experience itself, that doesn't necessarily require the concept along with it. It's through many kinds of experiences like that that we come to have a concept of a table, say. And basically seeing and touching the table multiple times or different types of tables and we develop because there's no one set type of table. There's so many different varieties, but we all kind of agree on the concept and there might be, you know, um, you know, for example, the table you're working on here doesn't even have a continuous surface so that, you know, it's it, but it's still a table. So the concepts can kind of be more right. composed of those, but. I guess, sorry. 
you move from the particular observation of some particular table, you see different types of table or different types of object, and you come up with a kind of schema by which you classify all of those disparate objects as of the same kind, say, as different types of tables. And you can move from there to more general categories, like say, that of furniture, that's relatively more abstract. And you get to the idea of an object. And then through the idea of an object, something very general, you can begin to use mathematical reasoning. So Hume thinks we can ultimately provide explanations of these kinds of concepts, which rationalists have claimed sort of uniquely require explanations involving reason. And Hume thinks there's this way in which we can identify how through experience we can gain knowledge of this. Recall, Hume thinks, there's two kinds of things that reason can ascertain. And this is going to be important in the kind of explanation when we get to this question of causation, because Hume thinks, look, there's only certain kinds of things that this could do, and so the resources are going to provide certain constraints here. So he thinks reason can recognize particular matters of fact, say that there is a table over there, that there's a certain rel relation or say like a distance that it obtains between two objects. And you can then make judgments about those ideas that the particular objects might count as instantiations of or as connected to. And it's through this that Hume thinks we can get these kind of mathematical, like, re recognition of these kind of mathematical relations. And so, say, Hume thinks we can explain the truth of the claim two is even by thinking about this concept of object, then the ways in which we could aggregate objects, and then we have the concept of even, which says, like, if a number can be divided by two and remain a whole object, then that's even. So Hume thinks we can explain the truth of this without having to commit to the existence of, say, a, f a completely kind of mind-independent form of number, where the form is something that exists outside of space and time. It's the kind of thing that Plato thinks exists in virtue of which we can derive these judgments about the nature of justice and other things. So Hume then turns his focus to this question of causation. It seems like causal judgments are incredibly core to our ordinary thinking. You say, believe that if you push on the accelerator, the car will move forward. Or that so long as it's in drive and you do that, it'll move forward. And you have to make many judgments that involve these sort of like causal like inferences or assumptions on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. It seems like navigating the world absolutely requires these things. Especially as technology progresses. Particularly as our capability to have like greater causal impact on the world does. Yeah. But how do we get this sort of idea of causation in the first place? And like, what exactly is it? And what are the conditions under which we can sort of appropriately apply the claim that say this sort of thing caused this sort of thing, this event caused this event, or that say, force applied to the ball on the table caused it to move. In the case of a game of pool. Right. So Hume says, well, if we think about our, our sort of mental experience of these judgments, well, certainly we don't see causal relations like in the world. They're not things which can be 
objects of our experience in some sort of determinate fashion such that I can say like I saw that this thing caused this yeah or they're I mean maybe you could say that they're not their dimension they're like fourth they're in a dimension of time where you can't like it's either things are either usually one state or the other but you can't you know or they're in progress but there's no like um you know there's you can't capture that essence with your hand as you can like you can touch the pool cue you can touch the ball you can touch the table but you can't necessarily touch the angle or the spin right you can he says when you have these kinds of events and say every time like one ball hits the other the second one moves he says like it seems like we draw our sort of notion of causal relation there from a kind of constant conjunction such that, well, I just always see that when I have these kind of starting conditions and one ball hits the other, then that second one moves. And so it's because of this kind of constant conjunction that I become habituated to expecting that things will go similarly in the future. And, he says, if we think about, like, what this expectation manifests it as, it's not just that, like, things will go generally like that. It's that, like, it will always happen this way. And it's in virtue of this that we make many kind of judgments about the world. And these often end up being quite useful in our navigating it. And his question is, well, but is it just a matter of habit or is there some way in which we can really kind of justify these judgments? Because if it's just a matter of habit, then there's the kind of problem that there might be multiple explanations for why a particular series of events happens in, in conformity with a particular kind of like descriptive phenomena or say like a particular kind of theory of what will happen. And there might be some like more expansive explanation which shows that the pattern that has been observed up to this point will not be repeated in the future or will deviate in some substantial way. So he says that we can think of our notion of causation as being kind of mapped out, as you see here, where you have some initial cause say, that you apply force to one of the pool balls. That then results in that moving across the table. It coming into contact with and distributing some of the force and energy that is contained within it into the next ball, that moving, and then, say, hitting another another ball or hitting the side of the table and bouncing off. And if all sort of events can be explained in this manner, and this is the kind of, like, view that Hume is operating on, he thinks that, look, we can explain quite comprehensively why it is that things have developed in the way they have in virtue of these kinds of mechanistic explanations. And so all that we really see when we sort of like turn upon our experience and like interrogate it is we see that, well, this type of event, which we have like classified as a particular type, we found a means of sort of encoding these disparate instances of events into some generalized type. Classifications. Yeah. We see then that those are always sort of conjoined with instances of another type. And on the basis of that, we say, well, look, this one caused the other. But that goes somewhat beyond what is sort of substantially or completely given by our experience. We make inferences beyond that, some leaps that require some amount of logical risk. And so he says, well, let's think about how it is that we should sort of formalize these causal judgments. If it's a matter of, say, seeing that, well, things have often gone this way in the past, and so anticipating things will go similarly in the future, then... This is just a kind of classical type of induction. And it's not so different from, say, like counting swans and seeing, well, like the first 52 swans I've counted have had white feathers. And so on the basis of that, I conclude all swans have white feathers. 
That's you can, you can the... found you can found the idea of Swan. You can you can declare that exists. Or say you've you've already got like a means of classifying things like as swans and non swans. Yeah. Taxonomies. And then yeah. yeah. And then you count a whole bunch of particular instances of the type. Okay. And you say each of these has white feathers. And so you generalize from those particular instances, like to this kind of universal claim. This is true of all swans. Yeah. I guess that would I just that would involve someone telling you that it's a swan or some something on some level because the idea. You'd have yeah, to otherwise, have the concept you might call it a, some other already. word. Okay, right. yeah, okay. When we make judgments about causal relations, it seems like it follows much the same pattern. We say, well, we've seen that these two events or these two kinds of events have been joined together in the past, and from so many instances, we make this claim we make this kind of inductive judgment about what the future will be like. And so we can figure out like what it is we're going to do, how we're going to coordinate our action, etc. Yeah. If we think about that case with the swans, like obviously there's nothing contained in this observation about 52 swans that necessitates that all swans are like this. And with swans, it's been observed that in Australia, there's black swans and so this kind of judgment isn't going to be secure. And Hume is saying, well, likewise, how do we know that our judgments about causal relations, about, say, if this happens, then this will happen? How is that any more secure than this judgment about the nature of swans? And it seems like this, under kind of ordinary assumptions, is going to be kind of devastating for the possibility of our scientific knowledge because it seems like this is the means by which we come to judgments like, well, this is a universal property of water, say that at sea level and at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, it's going to boil. It seems like this operates on much the same kind of judgment pattern or same kind of inference pattern where I have these multiple prior observation instances and I make some, some conclusion about what this will always be like. So we've noted previously that deductive arguments have a kind of clear standard we can apply to evaluate them. They can be valid. So if an argument is valid, then if its premises are true, its conclusion must be true in virtue of the kind of form it has because the informational content of the conclusion doesn't go substantially beyond the informational content of the premises, or it's necessitated by the premises. If a valid argument has true, all, all of its premises are true, then its conclusion by necessity will be true. Those arguments are sound. With inductive arguments, we could perhaps arbitrate about how strong they are, how much evidence seems to be given in support of one as opposed to another, if the arguments are concerning similar objects, say. But part of the problem here is we can't actually institute any clear standards such that we could even say, well, if you have more observation instances, then you can have more confidence. What it turns out is, well, if we're making judgments about a totality, then we don't know how many objects, and we don't know how many objects exist in that totality, we can't say exactly how confident we should be given some sample size of observations. Say if I've seen 52 swans, and if I've seen 250, one might think, well, if I've seen 250, I could be more confident than if I've seen 52. And the kind of problem that Hume is raising here, and the way in which this undermines induction is that he thinks there's no actual like objective way in which I could say that the observation containing 250 instances, say it's like of a different type of creature, is going to be more certain or more justified than the instance in which I've seen 56 of a thing. So one might have thought that, well, 
in the case of inductive judgments, I could perhaps think about what I could know in terms of something like a scale. And so say, there's certain things that I can be absolutely confident in. Descartes thinks, well, I can know that if I'm thinking, then I must be existing. There's certain things that you can perhaps know are false. So we can talk about the absolute rejection of a claim, say, there are no square cubes, or there's, yeah, no square cubes. This involves a kind of category mistake. Um, a square is a two-dimensional object, a cube is a three-dimensional object. For a lot of ordinary empirical judgments, say that there is a large cat over there, I might say, well, I don't know one way or the other, and the evidence I have seems incomplete. It perhaps doesn't tell me one way or the other. We could represent this sort of like state of non-belief one way or the other as like numerically 0.5, say, I think it's just as likely that it's true as that it is false. And perhaps I could adjust my confidence according to new information. Perhaps there could be like confirming information and disconfirming information, such that in light of which I could raise or lower my confidence accordingly. And what Hume is saying is there's actually no way in which we could objectively set up such a kind of theory of confidence we would have to make certain kind of logical leaps. Um, Thomas Bayes in the 20th century argues that although we can't do this on objective grounds, we could develop a system of subjective confidence and we could develop a kind of alternative means. For Hume though, he thinks, well, so inductive arguments, unlike deductive arguments, don't carry with them a clear standard of justification and evaluation. There's no determinate means by which I can say one inductive argument is stronger than another. What may seem quite certain to me on the basis of habit or expectation may turn out to be false in the future. What could be explained by one pattern of explanation might be explicable in terms of some alternative. And when we then think about the kind of underlying mechanics involved here, we say, well, so what are the limitations of this upon our knowledge? What is it that we can know about the world? What is it that we can accurately predict? Hume thinks, well, look, our inductive judgments about the future seem to rely on the notion that we somehow can correctly apprehend what we might call the laws of nature, which we might conceive of as a system of conditionals that says, if this sort of event obtains, then this subsequent event will obtain. And Hume asks, well, how is it that we could actually have knowledge of these things? And what he's suggesting is, well, we actually can't. And so this has implications for the possibility of our knowledge about the natural world through enterprises like science. It implies that, well, some theories may perhaps like work better than others, but we can't ever say with certainty that one particular theory is true, or at least it poses a substantive challenge 
to that sort of view or judgment. So what Hume is suggesting is, well, then in order for our ordinary inductive judgments about the world to be sort of deeply warranted or justified, it would have to be the case that if we knew something about the laws of nature such that we could say, I know this will happen in the future of some particular event, then he says, well, how could it be that we could know that? And he thinks in terms of explanatory models, well, it could be that we know this hypothetically or conceptually somehow because of reason. Perhaps we apprehend a principle that says, if these conditions obtain, then these conditions in the future will obtain. He thinks there's going to be substantial problems for that kind of explanatory path. Or perhaps somehow we could experience the laws of nature and so come to know what they're like. And in virtue of that, we could have knowledge of them. And so Hume thinks this conditional, if we have knowledge of the laws of nature, it's either because of reason or because of experience. And what he argues then is it's actually not the case that either reason or experience can provide the kind of justification necessary for us to say that we know that some particular event will happen. And the consequence then is, he thinks, well, so we don't have knowledge of the laws of nature. And so our inductive judgments can't be fully justified. That doesn't mean that they can't be correct. Sometimes they will be, but we can't provide a sort of thorough and systematic and demonstrable justification that they are. So, as I've noted, one way of thinking about this is that Hume is targeting the idea that we could even say, like, how much confidence we should have in a particular inductive judgment. He thinks we can't even do that. And, again, he thinks, like, these inductive judgments, they seem to crucially rely on the idea that we can ascertain what the laws of nature are like, such that we could say, like, things will be like this in the future. And that seems to rely on this judgment that, well, things in the future will be relevantly similar to things in the past. And this itself is a kind of inductive judgment because, well, it seems like things have gone this way so far. And Hume says, well, we can't simply justify induction by means of itself. That's a sort of circular justification. And, well, it shows that we can be consistent, but it doesn't actually provide the kind of justification that we would like that could be something like a proof. So, of reason, he says, well, what is it that I can ascertain I can see that one event follows another, but I can't see that they're connected by some like rational principle. I could perhaps come up with a principle which would explain or make consistent what I've observed. But the problem is I could come up with other rational principles that might be equally capable of explaining that phenomenon. And so if I think about the two of them, and they both explain this phenomenon, they do so in different ways, and perhaps they have different predictive contents, then I can't just sort of base my judgment, of which is true, or I can't fully justify that judgment on the basis that one seems to cohere with what I've seen. Because if I say, well, in virtue of it cohering with this, I can make accurate judgments about the future, then once again, I'm just sort of begging the question and saying just, induction is justified. So 
the argument is I can imagine different principles. It doesn't seem like one is particularly necessary. So it doesn't seem that reason can ascertain which principle is correct and which is not. So it seems like, well, we're going to have to rely on experience in part. And he thinks, well, how is it that experience could give us knowledge of the laws of nature? I experience, like, these particular sort of co components of events, say that, like, somebody throws a ball to me and, like, I, I catch it. I sort of feel, like, the force with which it was thrown. But I don't ascertain in that the sort of underlying law. I see only, or I feel only, sort of indirectly its effects. And I can come up with explanations of that that would explain multiple events I've experienced, or perhaps all such, of event, all such events. But this doesn't qualify as sort of a direct and immediate like, experience by which I become acquainted with the laws of nature. The laws of nature are, to some extent, like hidden from me. They're ex hidden from our experience. So, Hume says, we don't have knowledge of the laws of nature, and this seems to quite significantly undermine the possibility of induction providing us with substantive knowledge. Okay. So, the kinds of questions you should be particularly concerned with here are the general form of Hume's argument, the implications this has for ordinary induction, how we might think of scientific knowledge, then as the implication, or what implications this has for scientific knowledge. Um, did you have any questions or thoughts um, before? <clears throat> yeah, I think I, I was just thinking um, ex exactly how we... Um, we can't, um, you know, throwing the ball is a good example. I think the pool table example is a good example. Like we can't experience an angle or we can't, you know, we can experience, you know, even something like uh, gravity, you know, you're throwing, you're talking about throwing the ball. We can't mm -hmm. actually experience gravity. We can feel the ball. We can feel the smack of it, or we might um, have different sensations of, of um, things, but we don't actually touch gravity or we don't touch, um, you know, these different um these mathematical principles are all sort of like evaluated, you know, we can, we agree on them, but they're, they're kind of, they're created through, uh, I think induction is, is the, uh, well, is, it's not that they're created. It's the, like the mechanics like exist in the world and it's that we don't have any means by which we can certainly apprehend them. Yeah. So the world sort of like remains necessarily like they touch us. We can't touch them. Mysterious to us in yeah. a way. Okay. 